For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us this bread at all times. Jesus answered, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. But as I stated, you have seen me, and you still do not believe. So be it. to let you know something because I implied and I didn't know I really implied it but I implied that I do dishes I do not <laughs> you go we okay okay <laughs> Whew. let's start with prayer father in heaven we do thank you and praise you for the snow for the sun for the rain that you give us for the blessings of life and eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord that you would love us is just beyond amazing grace and we just thank you and praise you Lord, open our eyes and open our ears to hear and see and give back to you just a fraction of what Jesus Christ gave to us. Lord, we thank you that your love is true, that we don't have to worry, that we don't have to plead for you to be right beside us, but you're there every step of the way. You'll never forsake us, never leave us. You're always there in the midst of the storm and in the mountaintop high, and we just thank you and praise you for that. And we long for the day when Jesus comes and claims us and, and spends forever with us. We thank you and praise you in his name. Amen. So last week, Merle ended for us with, he who, lets, he who has ears, let him hear what the uh, Spirit is saying to the churches. So that's where we're picking up today. He who has ears, let him hear. Okay, everybody, you got ears? Most of you got two of them, right? <laughs> So let's do that even more. And Mary Ann, if we'd listen more instead of this, we'd be cool. Mary Ann and I do that. Amen. Amen. See, we've got two of these. So only one of these. Only one of these. That's right. And we need to hear and obey. We take that all the way back to the Old Testament when God gave the law. It's not for us just to hear and, and let it sit there and do nothing with it. It's to hear and obey. If you don't obey, you're not really listening. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, verse 11, verse 17, verse 29, chapter 3, verse 6, chapter 3, verse 13, and chapter 3, verse 22, you will read, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. But if you look at the first three letters, Jesus adds a little bit to that and then he stops. I don't know for what reason. But I want to look at those today. Revelation 2, 7 says, To the one who overcomes, I will grant the right to eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God. Revelation 2, 11 says, The one who overcomes will not be harmed by the second death. And Revelation 2, 17 says, To the one who overcomes, I will give hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone inscribed with a new name, known only to the one who receives it. Those promises are made to the ones who overcome, and they're said after Jesus says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So we've got three promises right off in those first letters. And if you remember, the first letter says, You love me, but you don't love me like you first love me. And the last letter says, I'm not going to tolerate a lukewarm love. But in these first three letters, Jesus gives promises to those who overcome. If you haven't figured it out yet, these P.S. I love you letters are about your relationship with Jesus Christ, period. Where do you stand there? Is he just an acquaintance to you? Is he a love to you among other loves? Or is he the love of your life? Do you love him with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength? And if you do, are you loving others as Christ loved them? That's what we're called to do. We're given new life to do it. God dwells with us so that we can do it. It is the mission of the church to live as Christ loved, to be His hands and feet. All of these are love letters where Jesus is saying to us, 
I love you. Are you listening? Will you respond out of love and obedience back to me? And if you do, you will be an overcomer. You will be granted the right to eat from the tree of life and the paradise of God. You will not be harmed by the second death. You will be given hidden manna, and you will be given a white stone inscribed with a new name. These are promises to those who truly love Jesus and are obedient to Him. Now, if you've read scriptures, you might notice that you hear those words, He who has an ear. Other than that, Jesus said it several times when He was preaching, when He was here on earth. In Matthew 11, starting in verse 15, we read, He who has ears, let him hear. Matthew 11, verse 16. To what can I compare this generation? And I wonder how much it compares to this generation now. This generation who claims to be children of God, to know God's laws and commands, but doesn't do them, or does them in such a way that I can follow God's commands, but you can't, or whatever it is. Jesus called them blind, leading the blind to destruction. We want to be those that are leading by the loving things that we do, drawing people into the kingdom of heaven. To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in a marketplace and calling out to others. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking. He didn't celebrate this life. He spent this life proclaiming that Jesus Christ was coming and you needed to repent and be baptized and change the way you live. But see, Jesus came to give you life and to give you life abundant. He came to give you power over sin. He came to call you to be fishers of men. John didn't know all of those things. So he called for you to repent, and he didn't eat or drink. He spent his time preaching repentance. And they said he was a demon. Verse 19, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. He enjoyed and he spent time in relationships with people, teaching them how to live, teaching them to be fishers of men, because he would make them fishers of men if they would only be obedient. But the people said, look at this glutton and drunkard, because he's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner, right? Aren't you glad that Jesus befriended us? Why in the world would you want to keep that from someone else? God's love and his amazing, amazing, amazing grace. But wisdom is vindicated by her actions. Now, you can take that verse however you want to, but what hits me here on it is that my faith is going to be proved by what I do then with what Jesus tells me. That I don't just say, oh, these are great commandments and everything, that I don't pick and choose what I want, but that I live as if this was the breathing word of God himself. Calling out to me, I love you so much. Will you show that love in return if you truly believe? Verse 20, then Jesus began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles had performed because they did not repent. They didn't change their mind. They didn't let the Spirit of God transform them to understand their life is not their own. You're a created being. That means you were created for a purpose. And Jesus died to give you new life. So even if you didn't live before for God, you can now if you choose to let the Spirit transform you. You are a new creation in Christ. But you've got to feed upon the Word just like you feed upon literal food. You've got to love the Lord with all of your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength, and you've got to love others. You've got to be in a loving relationship with Jesus. Not just a relationship, but that He's the love of your life, and your life shows it. Woe to you, Chorazan, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. Jesus Christ came once to forgive, to give you a chance to reconcile yourself back to God if you simply believe. 
and he will come again to claim his own and put, cast judgment on those who do not love him. And the sad thing about Scripture is, is that many will not find that narrow road. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth because they thought that they were saved. They thought they had a relationship with Jesus Christ. They even had actions that showed it, but their heart wasn't in love with God through Jesus. They weren't born again. They did not have eternal life. And you, Capernaum, you, will you be lifted up to heaven? No, you will be brought down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. At that time, Jesus declared, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. You don't have to have all the knowledge. You certainly don't have to have status or anything else. You simply need to come to God, to Jesus, as a little child. A little child that comes up and says, I love you, I trust you, I don't worry about what, how I'm going to be fed or anything else. I just want to be with you, Daddy. You are my provider. You care for me. You love me. I don't doubt it. I simply trust in you, and I love you because you are my Father. That's all we have to do. Come to Jesus that way. He's standing there ready to embrace us, and He'll never, ever let us go. Verse 26, Yes, Father, for this was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been entrusted to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in just a little second, because that verse is in this little jar here. That's why I brought it in. That was this verse from this week, wasn't it, Sherry? Randomly. <laughs> it's been so cool, the verses that she's picked out. I didn't pick them out. And they fit right together with what my sermon is. And I don't even realize it until I'm putting it together. I'm like, hey, that's our verse. Because we're meditating on those scriptures, those promises of Jesus. His promises to me so that I take that and think about it and how I'm going to apply that promise back. Don't be like the children of this world. Live like a child of the kingdom of heaven, if in fact you are the kingdom of heaven. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying life. Jesus enjoyed life. He built relationships. But He didn't keep His focus off of His mission. He kept His eyes and focus on the mission, even to death on a cross. He gave up the things of this world so that He could gain you and I. That's the love that Jesus has for us. My scriptures so far have been, John 10.10, 10, I have come so that you'll have life and have life to the fullest. Luke 10.20, rejoice, not because you can cast out demons or anything, but because you're, you have eternal life. Your name is written in heaven. Matthew 5.12, rejoice because great is your reward in heaven. And then this week's verse for us, Matthew 5, 12, that I can come to Jesus and find rest no matter what. That's what our verses have been. And there's my conversation back with Jesus about it. Now, Sherry's got her own jar. And the reason I say it again today is I'm going to put beans in these jars next if you guys don't take any more of them and do your promises. There's plenty here. You can give them to a child, to a spouse, whatever if you want them. There's plenty of these. These are what's left. If they're in here after today, they won't be here. Fair enough? So they're open to you to take. There's still a couple of the neighboring challenges. And if you, and I'm not trying to take from Bob's Sunday school, but if you're not going to Sunday school, you can come downstairs and we're going over this book about this neighboring challenge. Because what good is it to take all of these commands of Jesus and not apply them to the world? What good is it to go and get a degree in medicine and never save anybody's life. What good is it? You are the light of the world. Who would ever put a light under a bushel? No, right? I think that's how the song goes anyway, right? 
And I'm not going to let Satan f it out. I'm going to let it shine. We did that Wednesday night, didn't we? I'm going to let it shine. Because God loved me so much that I cannot be silent about it. Matthew chapter 13, verse 9, you will read, He who has ears, let him hear. You will also find this account in Mark and Luke. This comes after the story of the farmer and the seed. You know that one? Where some went on the, dry gra on the hard ground, some went on... You know that, correct? And you know there's only one type of soil that a farmer would want. The one that's pliable, that's rich in nutrients, the one that produces a crop. That's what you and I are supposed to do. Are you producing a crop? Are you teaching your children and your grandchildren and are you living in such a way that they see your faith and that they ask you about it because they see that hope that you have, that joy that you have, that peace that you have regardless of the circumstance and they see that love that you have for one another. I'll start um, in verse 11 now because this is where he goes after that. Jesus explains why he t teaches in parables and everything. In verse 11, he says, The knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. What? The knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Think about the complexity of that. They've been given to you. Wow. So what am I going to do with it? That's much bigger than going out and learning how to cure cancer. I have the keys and the knowledge and the wisdom of the kingdom of heaven that I can tell the world about to save them for all eternity. The knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away for him, from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing they do not see... Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. You have the ability to hear and understand, guess what? If you obey. Yeah, I put that in there because hearing means that you obey. So if you're not obeying, is God really listening or, or t speaking to you? And are you really listening? I've given an example before, like if I want to teach my child something... And he comes to me and says, how can I learn this? But he's on his phone. I'm not going to really teach him anything. If he comes to me and he's not distracted and wants to learn, I'll probably teach him some. But if he comes to me passionate, broken, whatever it is, energetic, and says, please teach me this, that's when I'm going to teach him. Because I'm more willing to teach him then, and he's more receptive to learning. And with that, he's probably more receptive to then doing something with it not just laying it aside right after that. How many things have you started and said, oh, I'm going to do this, and then they've fallen by the wayside in however long? Well, let me give you one example. How about New Year's resolutions every year? How long does it take to some of them are just, boop, oh, yeah, I, I tried that again. If you're really wanting to learn and you spend time seeking God, He will reveal Himself to you. If you spend time praying, He will answer you. What father does not want to give his child good gifts? How much more does your heavenly father not want to give you the Spirit of God himself so that you can do all things through Christ that gives you strength? So you can be a new person, a new creation in Christ, so that you can literally, as Jesus said, do greater things than he did, especially collectively as the body of Christ. Wow, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven that have been given to you so that you can reveal them to others. Rejoice not because you can cast out demons, but because your name is written in heaven and start building up treasures there. And whatever burdens you have, come to Jesus. He'll take them from you. His load is easy to bear. He bore it for you. He took your eternal death on His shoulders when He laid down His life on the cross to save you so that you could be in a relationship with Him forever. Will you follow Him? In Luke 14, starting in verse 25, large crowds were now traveling with Jesus. He turned to them and said, If anyone wants to come, if anyone comes to me 
and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. Yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. That's a tough verse. If I don't hate my father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, even my own life, I cannot be my, his disciple. Now, the first thing is I have a desire to come to Jesus in the first place. I know that he has the keys to eternal life. I know that he's the Messiah, the chosen one, the Son of God. I know that he's the way, the truth, and the life. But I'm not willing to hate everything of this world, even the things that I hold the most dear. Then I don't love him the way that I should love him. It's not telling us that we should hate our parents, nothing like that. It's not a verse that says that at all. But our love compared to him ought to be hatred for the things of this world. Oh, He gave us parents to honor and weigh heavy. He gave us children and their uh, heritage. He gave us a spouse to complete us. He wants us to be in loving relationships, but these loving relationships can't hold a candle to Him. He doesn't want you to not be loving your wife. My love for my wife will show me how great God's love for me is if I give up my selfish desires, maybe even wash dishes once in a while, who knows, to do things for her because I love her that much. And I thought about love this week as I was pondering this, and I thought about, you know, I don't do near the things that I did at first. And, you know, you have to do some soul searching to do that. And I think about the things that we did at that time. We don't do picnics now and notes now. Why not? Maybe. <laughs> but why don't we? Because we get complacent. I love her more today than I did when I first started courting her. And there's a big difference between courting and dating. You know, I, I decided she was the one and I courted her and I did things. I love her more now because of the things we've gone through. My love increases for all time. But I don't do those special things. Why not? What about my relationship with God and the time that I'm spending with Him and the quality of that time and the passion that I have for Him? Have I become complacent? That's some things that I'm struggling with. I'm not telling you, but you, hey, it's out there. But how is my relationship? I don't want it to grow cold. I want her to realize that she is special. Not just love, but special. So I've got to work on that. And it goes right back to my relationship with him. Is he what I live for? Because he is the reason that I have life. And the reason that I have eternal life. Sounds like I'm going back to John 10, 10, doesn't it? Where this path started. I have come to give you life and life abundantly. I don't want to waste this life. I want to make every second count for Him. Build up eternal rewards, not for me. And the satisfaction that I can get with that, I watched a sermon this week where the guy said, if, if I only knew that one person could be saved out of my ministry that I would give up all these other things. Do you feel that way? I do. The thing is, is we don't know, so we have to continue to fish and continue to fish and continue to fish and put our faith in God that there will be a catch, especially with the ones that we love the most. So we don't give up our hope. We don't give up our faith. We continue. I got a text. I'm going to cry. Sorry. <laughs> From somebody this week said they were praying for me. Just out of the blue. And I said, thank you, that means a lot. And he said, don't worry, I'll continue to pray until God answers this prayer and you realize it. Wow. That means so much. That somebody is praying for me, that somebody cares about me. And just randomly out of the blue. If you don't love Jesus, with all of your heart, it's on here, with all of your mind, that's what the green thing is, is the mind in his head, with all your little ant body, and with all of your soul, that it's not shining for him, then are you obeying what everything is telling you to do in this word?
And verse 27 says, whoever does not carry his cross and follow me can't be my disciple. So if you love Jesus passionately, if he's the love of your life, then you've got to have actions as a result. James was clear about that. Show me your faith without your works. You can't. It's dead. If you don't then carry your cross, your instrument of suffering and pain and death, if you're not willing to lay down your life for me as I was laid down my life for you, then you cannot be my disciple. You cannot follow in my footsteps. Verse 28, there's a cost involved. Which of you wishing to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost to see if he has the resources to complete it? Otherwise, if he lays the foundation and is unable to finish the work, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying this man could not finish what he had started to build. Or what king on his way to war with another king will not first sit down and consider whether he can engage with 10,000 men the one coming against him with 20,000? And if he is unable, he will send a delegation while the other king is still far off to ask for peace, for terms of peace. In the same way, anyone who does not give up everything he has, he cannot be my disciple. Three times we've seen why you can't be Jesus' disciple. Huh. We saw three times how you could be an overcomer and what you would get in return in Revelation, didn't we? Have you chosen to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? And are you living your life loving God in the way that you will be an overcomer? If you are, you will eat from the tree of life. You will not be harmed by the second death. You will be given some of the hidden manna and you will be given a white stone with a new name on it. <clears throat> 34, verse 34. Salt is good. Wait a minute, how do we just go to salt? Salt is good because that's what you are. You are the seasoning, the flavor, the preservatives for this world. But if the salt loses its savor, with what will it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the soil nor the manure pile. The soil, I wonder if that has anything to do with the farmer that came out. Hmm, I don't know, maybe. It's thrown out, isn't it? That salt that's worthless. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And if you keep reading in Luke, ironically, no, not ironically, you know what, by now when I say that, I don't mean that. The next thing that Jesus says is the lost sheep how he would go after one lost sheep because that one lost sheep is worth it. Do you have that passion for God so that you have that passion for others, that you'll pray for them, that you'll go after them, that you'll do whatever it takes to show them the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, to show them the way, the truth, and the life? Back to Revelation. He who has ears, let him hear what Jesus is saying in these seven letters to the churches. It's there in every one of them. Listen up. This is the P.S. words from Jesus about how much I love you because I know that it's easy to get complacent. I know that it's easy to get scared, distracted, everything else. You fight a spiritual battle, waging for your soul and waging for others. I understand all that. So you've got to love me like you originally did and you can't be lukewarm and we've got all these other things in between. Revelation 2, verse 7, To the one who overcomes, I will grant the right to eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God. Now you can take that whatever it means again, but if you go back to Genesis, there was a tree of life and we had a choice again whether to eat from that tree of life continually or the tree that we weren't supposed to eat from, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There's a, there's a choice here. Just like you had a choice that led you into a non-relationship with God, you have a choice that brings you into a right relationship with God. Will you feed from Jesus so that you will eat from this tree of life forever? And in Genesis 3.22, the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now lest he reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. This tree of life, whether it's a metaphor or whether it's real or whatever your thought process is there, 
Jesus gives the right to those who overcome to eat from that tree of life where you had been banished from it in the first place, lest you live forever. The consequence is you die forever. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And he said, you cannot be my disciple if you don't love me with everything. If you don't take up your cross and follow me, you can't be. But if you overcome, I will give you right to eat from the tree of life that you were banished from because of your sins. Because I took all of your sin, all of your shame upon me. I did that for you so that you could have life and have it abundantly. So it sounds like to me it's time to get to work, isn't it? Revelation 2.11, the one who overcomes will not be harmed by the second death. There is a second death. I know so many people say, how could a loving God send people to hell? He did everything he could to stop that. It cost him his one and only son. You have a choice. Eternal life where you won't be harmed by the second death or you will face the second death. Verse 17, To the one who overcomes, I will give hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone inscribed with a new name, known only to those who receive it. Now you know from the Old Testament that manna was food that came down from heaven. But what happened again with the children of God? They grumbled. They complained. They said, I don't want only this to eat. When it came down, it's food from heaven. Thank you. We didn't even know if we'd be fed out here or whatever, but you're taking care of us and it's delicious. But after a while, I don't want to eat the same thing. I'm getting tired of this. Isn't the world telling you that? That Jesus plus? Or you can keep on going and living this way and living for yourself and living for Jesus? Jesus says clearly, you've got to live for Him. You've got to love Him beyond everything. And then you'll overcome and you'll show others the way. And those that crumbled, grumbled and complained, many of them perished there. In fact, all of them except Joshua and Caleb perished without seeing the promised land, didn't they? Two men that were there in the beginning. And they still had to do something. They still had to, at 80 years old, Caleb had to fight the giants in the land. Jesus has fought this fight for you. He is victorious. You need to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after Him into eternal life so that you can eat from the tree of life, not be harmed by the second death, and be given spiritual food from heaven. And guess what? Jesus said in John 6, verse 47, Truly, truly, I tell you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Jesus is that hidden man. And the world thinks it's foolish, but you need to feed on Him while you're in this wilderness land so that you know that you go to the promised land. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness. There we go, manna, yet they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. Are you feeding off Jesus? Well, there's two things in Revelation 2, 17. The one is you'll be given hidden manna. The other is I will also give him a white stone inscribed with a new name. Now, if you read that, you've got to say, is that stone got my name on it or that stone got Jesus' name on it? Either way, I'm going with it's got your name because it's not clear there. But if it's got Jesus' name, then you've got a special relationship with Jesus that only you know his name. I'm the only one that calls her my love. That's what she's on my phone, my love. No one else can call her that because she's not the love of their life here on earth. She's my love. That's a special name that she has. But I think it's a new name that we have. Right or wrong, you can go either way with it. And that new name says that you're a new creation in Jesus Christ. That you have a new name written in heaven. That you don't have to worry about the sins that you used to do in your life. You don't have to worry about the failings and shortcomings that you have now. All you need to do is fix your eyes on Jesus. Because you have a new name that He calls you. <laughs> this, Jesus is saying, this is my Alan, whatever He calls me. Because I am the love of His life. 
<laughs> That's why I like it better that way. Either way works fine. But he loved me so much that he gave up his life for me. And if I would have been the only one, he would have gave up his life for me. I am special to him. I have a new name written on a white stone. If you study scripture, if you study history also, there's other things. A white stone was a vindication of judgment and things. But at Jesus' day, in the Roman games, and Paul writes a lot about that, the victors were given a white stone. It was a stone with their name written on it, showing that they had overcome. And it was also an entrance into the awards ceremony. You ain't going to give that stone to anybody else. And it's your entrance into the award ceremony with the others that overcame. Wow. If you lost that stone, you didn't get in. <laughs> that stone was special to you because you overcame. And that stone was what got you in to the celebration. Jesus is clear that there will be a celebration in heaven. And he says many will stand outside the door and knock. And he says, I won't let them in. I don't know them. There's no time to discuss it now or anything. There is time now to live for Jesus like He's the love of your life. If you have ears, listen and obey what Jesus is saying to the churches. So why would you fear then? Why wouldn't you love? The first letter to the church said, To the angel at the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him that holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Lamp stands. Jesus is the shepherd of this church. He shepherds me so that I can shepherd you. And it's a daily thing. So that we can live a life as a church that means that we're the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Not just so we just gather together, but so that we're a living, breathing organism, the body of Christ. Verse 2, I know your deeds, your labor, your perseverance, good things. I know that you can't tolerate those who are evil and and you have tested and exposed as liars those who falsely claim to be apostles. Without growing weary, you have persevered and endured many things for, my, for the sake of my name. All good things. But I have this against you, verse 4. I have this blame. I have this fault. I'm telling you about it now so that you can correct it. You have abandoned or left your first love. That's a question presented to you today from this letter. How is your love relationship with Jesus Christ? Therefore, keep in mind how far you have fallen. Repent and perform the deeds you did at first. Hmm. So I have been in self-examination saying, what did I do when I first came to Jesus Christ? You know, I didn't worry about the ridicule at all. I want to change anything in my life. Am I getting complacent at all? Do I not love Him as much as I did then? What things could I do to go back to that first love? If you do not repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place. You're not really a church after all, are you, if you're not living like the body of Christ? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who overcomes, I will grant the right to eat from the tree of life in paradise. Are we living like the body of Christ? The second letter to the churches. There is a cost. Jesus knows there's a cost. He suffered and died. You shouldn't think that you won't suffer and die. To the angel at the church of Smyrna in verse 8, these are the words of the first and the last, the one who did die and returned to life. So don't fear that death. You will get to eat from the tree of life and you won't be harmed by the second death. Verse 9, I know your affliction and your poverty, though you are rich. I am aware of the slander of those who falsely claim to be Jews, but are in fact a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you, and you will suffer tribulation for ten days. It doesn't get any better. But if you notice, there's not, I have this against you in this letter. You love me. You've continued to love me, continue to suffer. You've continued to hold on to that first love because I am the love of your life and you love me with all your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength, and you love others. Be faithful even unto death and I will give you crown of life. 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who overcomes will not be harmed by the second death. I didn't mention anything about the crown before, because that comes before the, if you've got ears, let, you, let them hear it. But Jesus does promise that those who overcome will reign with Him. Wow. Not just live with Him, but reign with Him. Third letter to the churches. To the angel of the church at Pergamum, write, These are the words of the one who holds a sharp, double-edged sword. Jesus is the Word made flesh and dwelled among us. He is everything that encompasses all of God's plan. He is God Himself. He died for us. He wants us to be with Him, and He lives inside of us. All these things... He has called us to be a church in the first letter, to be a living, breathing organism. He's called us in the second letter to suffer even unto death, and He's given us these promises. <clears throat> and here He says, I know where you live, where the throne of Satan sits. I believe that's here in the United States, and I know you do too. And I know you think that throne is growing in power and strength. Yet you have held fast to my name and have not denied your faith in me. Even in the day when my faithful witness Animus was killed among you. Now we get to see an actual person who suffered and died. Verse 14, but I have a few things against you. Because some of you hold on to the teachings, teachings of Balaam who taught Balak the place of, to place a stumbling block before the Israelites. So they would eat food sacrificed to idols and commit sexual immorality. Okay. Tying that back together. False gods. You have this choice in front of you to be enticed by the world and the riches of this world and the way that the world tells you to live or you have this choice in front of you to hold fast to Jesus. If you're a church, you'll be a living, breathing organism. You will suffer even unto death. We've got a real example of this. And you do fight a spiritual battle waging for your love and affection. And that opposing battle leads to death rather than life. What things are you holding on to this world that you need to give to Jesus? To offer up to Him and say, I'm sorry for not trusting you enough that I've worried about money over you. Or that I've focused too much on my career. Or whatever it is. I don't know. That's for you to decide. What things have you held from your love that's kept you from serving God with everything that you have? In the same way, some of you hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. And we don't know exactly what that is, but it doesn't matter. We need to look at our own selves. Here's what you need to do, verse 16. Therefore repent, or I will come to you shortly and wage war against them with the sword of my mouth. Huh. Right here it is. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. By your love for one another, you will be known. I can give you a bunch more. If you're not living by this word, then this word is accusing you. It's your choice. These are the words of life. This is a love letter to you. You're either following it because you know God's love for you or you're not following it because there's some fear or some love for something else keeping you from following these words. And these are the words of life. Verse 17, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. If they will listen and obey to the one who overcomes, I will give the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone inscribed with a name known only to the one who receives it. You can be assured, period, that you're in a special relationship with Jesus Christ. So special that no one else shares because you've got a special name from Him or he's got a special name, whichever way it is. <laughs> Either way. Because you're in a loving relationship. Jesus is the food that nourishes your heart, your soul, your body, your mind for all eternity. All the way home. 
John 6, where we started, verse 33. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives what? Life to the world. Have you taken his gift? Is it everything to you? Or is it eh, to you? Is it everything to you? Every breath that you take because God loves you so much. Verse 34, they said back to him, Sir, they said, give us this bread all the time. Are you saying that? They weren't genuine, but they still said, give us this bread all the time. Are you constantly thanking God? Are you constantly praying? Are you constantly reading His Word? Are you constantly meditating? Are you constantly fellowshipping, trying to learn more, trying to do things, trying to live by His power rather than yours? Jesus answered, I am the bread of life. Let me tell you this again. I am, so you know this, because you just asked me for this, but you don't really mean it. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. But as I stated, you have seen me, and still you don't believe. That's the outcome of those verses in John 6. And if you read on, you'll know that Jesus had to even ask His 12, Are you going to depart from me? But they didn't. They denied themselves. They took up their cross. And they followed after Jesus even unto death. Because He holds the keys to eternal life. And He loved them so much that He would come and give up His life for them. Even though they didn't understand it, they wanted the kingdom of Israel to come at that time. They followed after Jesus because He loved them enough to come to save them. He meant everything to them. Does He mean everything to you today? Father in heaven, we thank You and praise You that Jesus would give up His life. Lord, help us to follow after Him individually and as a church, to feed on Him and to live as He lived, even if it means suffering, even if we think we don't have the strength or the power or anything else. Lord, let us feed upon Jesus to be strengthened and to nourish, and to give food to others, and not withhold it because of selfishness or fear or anything else, but be a light to this world. And Lord, we put our faith and trust in You that if we agree and do to be part of the harvest, that we put the harvest in Your hands because you are so amazing. And it is not, it's your will that none suffer and die. We just thank you that Jesus gave us the pattern, that he gave us the commands, and he gave us the power to live. Lord, fill us with the love of Jesus and help us to show it in return. We pray this in his precious name. Amen.